Thank you for taking time to worship today and thank you for being flexible as we deal with this heat wave that's upon us in Southern California. Before we read this morning's text, Psalm 61, you can go ahead and find Psalm 61 in your Bible. Psalm 61, a Psalm of David. Before we get there, I want to tell you a story about a bus driver I met on a recent trip to Cuba. He was a sweet man by the name of Dios Eli. If you know what Dios means in Spanish, I assure you, I had the same reaction when I finally could make out his name through his thick Havana Spanish accent. Dios means God, and Eli means my God. God, my God. That's his name in English. If you're expecting or thinking about future baby names, God, my God is probably, hopefully not high on the list. I mean, just think about our dilemma all week in Cuba. We need to get this bus rolling. Where's God? Or do you think Dios Eli, God my God, knows where he's taking us? Dios Eli, God my God, isn't falling asleep at the wheel, is he? Well, if you think that sounds maybe a little sacrilegious, you should probably spend some time reading the Psalms. Because the Psalms ask these kinds of questions all the time. And it sure seems like some of these kinds of questions in the Psalms were written for such a time as this. 2020, the year we all wish was over. You know, sometimes, if we're honest, it seems like God isn't even driving the bus. If we can be as honest as God's inspired word in the Psalms for just a moment, in so many ways, 2020 has seemed like God isn't driving the bus. A worldwide pandemic, and a polarizing pandemic at that, civil unrest and racial tension, competing narratives, conflicting reports and opinions on all of the above, and throw in not just all the pressing problems on a world or a national scale, but make it personal for just a moment. What about the circle of problems in your own life, in your own family, your own personal problems that only you know about? What do we do when it seems like God isn't driving the bus? Well, what we do is we turn to the book of Psalms, where the psalmists don't seem to be as afraid as us to ask the uncomfortably hard questions. Is God there? What is God doing? Where are you, God? Have you abandoned us? See, the Psalms lead us through that pain and frustration and confusion when we feel abandoned, leading us to our great God, the rock who is higher, the refuge who is stronger, the redeemer who is faithful and who does have everything under control. And the path to that kind of peace is through prayer. The road leading to that rest travels by prayer through the often dark and tangled wood of worshiping God when we can't see the light and trusting in God that he is indeed driving the bus, and that he knows the way, that we can rely on him when we don't even see where he's taking us. So, with all that in mind, let's hear from God's word in Psalm 61, and then I want to look at a road map for prayer with you from this beautiful psalm. Psalm 61 says, Hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. So will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. So far the reading of God's word. Father, as Christ prayed for us, sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. So what do we have here in Psalm 61? Well, Psalm 61 gives us a really useful roadmap for praying in trials. Through the twists and turns of life, we have a roadmap for bringing our confusion, our frustration, and our trust to God in prayer. The first stop on this roadmap to prayer is crying out. Crying out. Crying out for God's guidance. We see this in verses 1 and 2. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. We cry out for God's guidance when we feel distant. From the end of the earth, David says. Have you ever felt that distant from God? From the end of the earth, we cry out. We talk a lot about social distancing these days. I saw an article this week that said, we're all socially awkward now. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? But we can feel spiritually awkward too. 
in prayer with God. It can seem like we love God, we treasure Him, and we want to sense His nearness, but it seems like we can't even manage a fist bump or an elbow tap in prayer. Just nothing. The ends of the earth. That's how distant we can feel from God, whether we're literally in a faraway country, or sitting in the very same chair we always sit in at church, or perched out in the parking lot, since this is 2020 we're talking about, right? The parking lot that's too hot for us to sit in today. Well, our pain can put a sense of distance between us and God. That's when we cry out for Him to lead us to more safety than we can find in ourselves. We cry out when we feel crushed, too. When my heart is faint, David says. Our suffering, whether it's emotional, financial, relational, or really physical, it can all feel physically crushing. I'm sure you've felt that during this COVID pandemic. Even if you haven't gotten physically sick, there's a way this grates on us in body and soul because that's what we are. That's what we were created to be, body and soul all wrapped up together. And being body and soul can hurt sometimes. The Lord knows it. He knows who and what we are, and we can pray into that knowledge that the Lord has of us, crying out to God in trust. One of my favorite writers on the book of Psalms is the 18th century Anglican Bishop George Horn, and his commentary on the book of Psalms is just through and through Christ-centered and really devotional. I love his thoughts on this opening verse. Brushed up a little into modern English, here's what George Horn says. He says, The church, extending far and wide among the nations, cries out in a loud voice to God through the prayers of church members, all the way from the end of the earth. The world is to Christians a sea of troubles and temptations, from which they daily beg God to deliver them and to place them on the rock of their salvation. And that rock is Christ, he says. Standing securely on him by faith in his sufferings and exaltation, we may defy all the storms and raging waters that can be raised against us by the adversary, while as if from the top of a high mountain on the shore, we see the waves dashing themselves in pieces beneath us. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it? I think that really captures this sense of the rock that is higher than I. This rock of safety, this cliff of safety. Maybe you've stood on the sunset cliffs down in San Diego, hopefully not too close to the edge, and you've seen the tide come in at sunset with the waves crashing against the cliffs below, right? Dashing themselves in pieces. A dangerous thing, but from the safety of the cliff, it's a thing of beauty. You know, that's how we can look at our trials when we're standing safely on Christ, who is our rock, our refuge our cliff of safety. We can find beauty in the madness because we know that it's all working together for our good and God's glory. This is why we pray, lead me, Lord, to the rock that is higher than I. So that's the first stop on this roadmap to prayer, crying out for God's guidance. The second stop in, in Psalm 61 and in this roadmap for prayer is remembering, remembering God's faithfulness. Verse 3, David writes, for you have been my refuge, a strong tower. The tense of the verbs here is important. It's not for you are, not for you will be, but for you have been my refuge, a strong tower. See, if the Psalms teach us anything, it's the importance of remembering. So many times the psalmists start out totally lost and confused, not knowing what to do, sad, depressed, and then the psalmist remembers. He remembers the faithfulness of God in the past that grounds his present confidence and his future hope. You know, forgetting God and forgetting his faithfulness caused many of the problems God's people faced in the Old Testament. Isaiah 17 comes to mind, where God gives the reason he's sending judgment upon his people. This is Isaiah 17, verse 10. God says, For you have forgotten the God of your salvation, and have not remembered the rock of your refuge. When you forget the rock of your refuge, the Lord God of your salvation, you start looking for false gods, substitute saviors, puny rescuers that can never give you refuge. In a topsy-turvy 2020, or any other time for that matter, you won't find refuge in the stock market. You won't find refuge in health. You won't find refuge in indulging your fleshly desires. There is only one rock of refuge. There is only one God, the one living and true God, and He alone can save. We have to remember the God of our salvation, not just who He is or what He promises in the future, but what He has done and how He has been faithful to us in the past. 
memory of God's mighty protection motivates our prayers for him to do it again. Memory of our personal experiences of deliverance and ultimately of the greatest instance of God's faithfulness when Christ was crushed for our sins so that we could be hidden in him our refuge forever. That's what we have to remember. As Paul would say, if God's given us Jesus, what won't he give us? So we remember God's faithfulness. We cry out for God's guidance. We remember God's faithfulness. And then there's the third stop, and it's longing. Longing for God's presence. Look at what David writes in verse 4. He says, let me dwell and take refuge. In trials, you see, we don't just cry out for rescue. We shouldn't anyway. Get me out of this. Okay, see ya. Well, by doing that, we've turned God into a little more than a divine ATM machine that we expect to spit out the cash when we need to catch a break. But refuge implies more than that. It implies a relationship and not just a transaction. Let me dwell and take refuge. There's something about refuge and closeness to God that's different than just asking for deliverance. As David puts it in verse 4, we cry out to dwell in the Lord's tent. This is like the little kid knocking at the bedroom door in the thunderstorm. Mommy, Daddy, can I sleep in Mommy and Daddy's bed tonight? Switching metaphors, David says, Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings. Like a mother hen covering her chicks. This intimate picture of the baby bird nestled up under the mother's wings. We long for God's presence as we pray in our trials. I think Derek Kidner in his commentary really captures how this roadmap of prayer takes us closer and closer to the heart of God in such a beautifully intimate way. Kidner says, God's safekeeping is viewed here in increasingly personal terms, as the aloof ruggedness of the high crag of verse 2 gives place to the purpose-built tower of verse 3, and this in turn to the hospitality of the frail tent with its implication of safety among friends. And finally, the affectionate parental shelter symbolized by the wings. This, the wings, against all appearances, is the best security of all. The best security of all. Let me take refuge under the shelter of God's wings. So we cry out for God's guidance. We remember God's faithfulness. We long for God's presence. And then there's the final stop, and it's trusting. Trusting God's promises. You see, things kind of get interesting here in Psalm 61. So far, everything David says connects pretty easily with our own experience, but then he says, prolong the life of the king. You're not a king, I'm not a king, so what do we make of this? See, David is banking here on a specific promise made to him. In 2 Samuel 7, the Davidic covenant and an heir to his throne who would reign forever. That promise hasn't been fulfilled yet when David writes Psalm 61. You see, that fulfillment would ultimately come in Jesus, the greater son of David, who now reigns from his throne forever and ever over his church, 2020 being no exception. What's so amazing is that because God made true on this promise, this covenant to David, you and I have every reason to trust him. The greater son of David, the lion of Judah, and the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world was slain for us and sits on the throne ruling over us and all this world, 2020 included. Every promise the Lord has ever made is yes and amen in Jesus. That's only the case, because when faced with the turbulent storm of God's wrath in the place of sinners like you and me, Christ found no cliff of safety. He found no tower of refuge. He found no welcoming tent and no sheltering wings. He bore the full brunt of God's wrath upon himself, that wrath that awaited us in our sin, that awaits you in your sin. If you refuse to turn to God and by faith receive Christ as Redeemer and Refuge. Because Jesus has done this for us, for you, do you know what that means? It means we can follow this roadmap of prayer with confidence before his throne of grace. We can pray trusting God's promises. Well, Psalm 61 ends with a promise to sing forever and David promises to offer vows day after day. Singing forever, we get that, but vows, not so much. What do we make of that? Well, vows were like thank offerings to the Lord, and usually they were a one-time thing. Request granted, vowed offered, and done. That's it. But David says, no way. I'm thanking the Lord forever for his faithfulness, day after day after day. See, that's where prayer and the trial should bring us. 
even before we pulled out of the pit, even before all the danger around us goes away, even in the middle of unrest and uncertainty and dangers and toils and snares, because we know as a fact and a certainty that we can cry out for God's guidance and we know that God hears us. We remember his faithfulness. We long for God's presence and we trust in his promises. He's always made good on his promises in the past and he will always make good on his promises to his children in the future. We're safe and secure in Christ our Savior. Our feet are on the higher rock of Christ who is ruling over all things from the throne of his grace. The waves crashing below us can't hurt us in the end. We're tucked safely away under the powerful, protecting wings of the Lord our Savior. And from that kind of safety, what can we do but sing his praise forever? Would you pray with me for just a moment, a simple prayer that we can say together? Lead me to the rock that is higher than I.